So I'm going to take you on a journey at a, some, a few different coral reefs around the world and I'll talk to you about some of the, the patterns that we're seeing out on reefs today and how they're responding to um, what really is a crisis with, related to climate change. So um, this is an aerial shot of Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef and I'll tell you a little about some of the work we're doing there. But just to start out with some background of what is a coral reef. So, this is an aerial shot of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, this white um, area here, this is all the skeleton of the corals that built this um, physical structure of the reef. And so coral reefs are really fascinating. They're actually the largest biologically built structures on our planet. So you can see the Great Barrier Reef from outer space, right? This is an enormous structure. It's like about the size of California for us American sort of geospatial scale <laughs> reference. Um, and that three-dimensional structure is really critical for the biodiversity that we see on coral reefs. So if we zoom in under the water, this is a picture from the Central Pacific on an uninhabited um, island. And we see you know, our charismatic megafauna, our big reef sharks here that you see swimming around. And all of these um, three-dimensional things here, these are individual corals thousands of different individuals that together through their growth um, build the three-dimensional structure of the reef. So if we zoom in a little more, if I break apart one of those coral heads, I might find a huge number of different little critters living within that coral head. So everything from shrimps and crabs and little fishes, starfish, all kinds of um, species. And so the, the biodiversity that we see on coral reefs, I can't overemphasize, like one out of four marine species living in our oceans interacts with coral reefs at some point in their life cycle. So even though coral reefs themselves cover, you know, much less than 1% of the seafloor, they have an enormous impact on the biodiversity uh, that we see out in the ocean. And so this is important just for both understanding the evolution of life on Earth and how diversity comes about, but also a lot of people rely on the animals that live around reefs for food. So things like fishes and shrimps and lobsters, um, are just some examples of things that we like to eat as humans, uh, but also they're an important source of um, medicines and pharmaceuticals because there's a, it takes a lot of really cool chemistry to survive and to compete and to avoid being eaten out on our reef. And so they're actually a wealth of resources for you know, anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial compounds that we still haven't even discovered. So incredibly important both for the natural world as well as for human societies. And so um, in my lab, we study corals, so the actual animal that builds that reef. And so the, the really neat thing about corals that makes them so productive and able to build those enormous structures is this microscopic symbiosis with algae. So algae are basically like single-celled plants, more or less, if you want to think of them like that. They do photosynthesis, so they take energy from the sun, water, and carbon dioxide, and they convert that into sugars. And these algae actually live inside of the cells of the coral animal. So here's our coral animal. It has tentacles here. Inside of these tentacles is a mouth. So these animals can also prey on plankton in the water column, so they can feed, capture prey, most of their nutrition actually comes from their algal symbionts. So they can get 90% or more of their nutrition from these symbionts. And so the feeding is sort of a supplementary activity that they perform. Okay, so if we take a little cartoon cross section of a coral, what we have here, this is the coral skeleton. So if you see a huge coral, it might fill the size of this space here. Only the very outer surface is living coral tissue. So most of that three-dimensional structure is just limestone skeleton. Um, and that just the first few millimeters to maybe an inch in some species is living tissue. And so you have this like thin veneer of tissue covering the surface of the skeleton and the cells that line the skeleton are actually what are laying down that calcium carbonate, which is forming actually outside of the body of the animal. Um, and then the coral kind of grows up as it lays down more skeleton. So you kind of have this like vertical growth patterns. Um, and if we zoom in, if this is a coral tentacle here, this is the mouth that I was mentioning that they can capture prey and feed. They have it one hole, so everything in all the weights goes out the same hole. So they're, um, so they're very early evolved animals on the tree of animal life. Um, and then if you zoom in here on this tentacle, these are like cartoon pictures of the, the cells. So we have stinging cells, which help them capture prey and defend themselves from predators and competitors that might try to overgrow them. And the cells in their gut are actually the cells that are full of those symbionts. So these little brown circles here 
are individual algal cells. And so those algae are inside of the animal's gut cells. So sort of like if you had plants feeding you inside of your intestines, right? So here we're eating pizza, but these corals don't actually need to eat for the most part to survive. Um, and so if I take um, a fluorescent picture of these corals, what you can see is this red color here. This is the algae, and it's just their chlorophyll pigments that they have to harvest light. So I haven't stained these corals with any fluorescent dyes or anything. This is just if you look at corals under a blue light, this is what they look like. Um, the green that you see here and the ends of the tentacles is green fluorescent protein. Have you, any of you heard of GFP? Right, this is a really common tool that we use in molecular biology. It was discovered in jellyfish, which are really close cousin of corals, and corals also just express GFP in their tissues normally. So this is not a transgenic coral, this is just what they do. And so we don't really know what they use GFP for. It might be kind of like a sunscreen, it might help them harvest different pigments of light. It's sort of an unknown in coral biology, but they have a ton of it. Like sometimes half of the protein in a coral is GFP. So it's clearly something that they're investing a lot of energy into and is important, but we don't really know what they do. But for us, we also are interested in you know, the proteins that corals use to, to grow and to run their metabolism. And we can't do like a traditional GFP tag because they already have GFP. So it would just be lost in the background. So we have to get a little more um, creative with the colors that we use to try to look to see where um, coral proteins are. Um, but anyway, so if I isolate coral cells from the tissues, which is a tool that we do use in the lab, we have our coral cell here is this sort of gray outline. And inside of this coral cell, we have two of those algal symbionts. So that's these like red circles here. And so what I kind of wanted you to take away from this picture is that this host cell is just chock full of symbionts. It's, and these symbionts are basically shrink wrapped inside of this host cell, right? So there's not a lot of wiggle room here. Um, and this is important because if we want to understand how the environment, how the surrounding seawater conditions, whether it's temperature or ocean acidification, which are the two main climate change stressors we see in our oceans, the algae aren't actually seeing that directly, right? They have to, they're inside of the tissues of the animal cell, and so the animal has the opportunity to control the access that that algae has to things like nutrients um, and so on. So, um, so one of the things in my lab is we're trying to understand, like, how do these two very different species communicate to one another? Like how do the sugars from algal photosynthesis get into the host cell? Like what does the host do to promote the biology of its symbionts living inside of it? Because now you have this dependent, could be parasite living inside of you. These are protists which are very closely related to malaria parasites that infect humans. So, um, you know, it's sort of like a complicated back and forth between am I a mutualist or I'm giving a benefit to my host or am I a parasite? And so there's these dynamics sort of play out as these two very different species interact with each other. Um, and we're of course interested in my lab and how the surrounding environment influences that back and forth dynamic between these two different species. Okay, so here I'm zooming in on our single coral cell here, sort of outlined in this dotted white line. And we have two algae, again, living inside of this cell. And so one thing that we've observed is that the compartment that those algae are inside of in the host cell is acidic. Um, and so we were curious to figure out, like, how does that come about? Is the algae, you know, sending out acid to its outside to acidify this space? Is the coral host involved in that process? And so this green fluorescence that you see here is a fluorescent dye that fluoresces green at acidic pHs. Um, and hopefully you can see this. So we've got um, blue here, I've stained the nuclei with a blue dye. Um, and then with this red signal here that surrounds the algae is an antibody that's specific to a proton pump, so an acidifying pump that lives in the, the membranes of cells in all of you today. So your lysosomes, sort of the, the garbage cans of your cells use acidification, um, and they use this very same enzyme uh, called VHA um, to acidify that. So corals we found use this proton pump, this acid pump, to acidify the space where the algae are living. Um, and we think they do that to promote photosynthesis. So if you inhibit that acidification, you see this is oxygen evolution rate. Basically what I'm showing you is that how much photosynthesis those corals and their symbionts do drops when you lose that acidification. So this is, we think, a way for the host to promote algal photosynthesis, which allows the host access to more sugars and more food to grow, and then the algae can also make more of themselves inside of the host. 
Okay, but this symbiosis is really sensitive to high temperatures. So this is a picture from American Samoa where we have our before shot here. We have a very healthy coral reef community. This brown color are living corals. You see all this branching structure for fishes and things to live. On the right here was a marine heat wave that hit these islands in 2016, I believe is the year. And you can see they turn bright white. And so we call this coral bleaching because it looks like these corals bleached, like you could have dumped them in a bucket of bleach. They're bright white. These animals are still alive. What you're seeing is the skeleton beneath the translucent coral tissue. So they get their color that you see here comes from the symbionts. And when the temperatures get too high, that symbiosis gets disrupted between the coral animal and those algal symbionts. And we still don't know in coral biology, does the algae leave or does the coral kick it out? Um, there's a lot of different ways that bleaching can happen and it's probably all of the above. Um, but what the sort of functional consequence is these corals start to starve to death, right? As I told you, they get about 90% of their nutrition from their symbionts. If you don't have your symbionts, you're not getting the food you need to grow, to reproduce, and even to survive. And so if a heat wave goes on for long enough, these corals will starve to death. And you see widespread coral mortality after heat waves because of bleaching and then the stress that um, happens after bleaching. Um, and heat waves are becoming more common worldwide with rising ocean temperatures, so associated with climate change and the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and so these are just some pictures of other reefs. These are from Australia where we see bleaching. I mean, it's kind of like a ghostly majestic scene, right, where you have these white corals over here. Some of these, you can see sort of this purpley fluorescence that's actually fluorescent pigments from the animal that we're seeing here um, that you can't actually usually see to the naked eye when the symbionts are there because they kind of mask that fluorescence. So we're really interested in trying to understand what is happening during bleaching and what are the long-term consequences as corals are seeing these heat waves becoming both more intense as well as more frequent. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through three sort of short little stories about the research that we're doing. So one question that we have is trying to understand how does environmental memory, so a coral's prior exposure history to stressors, influence their performance to that same stressor again in the future. So, you know, one idea is that corals could be doing worse and worse and worse as you add stress upon stress upon stress, or they sort of get used to it, and we call that acclimatization and ecology where you see a temperature stressor, but it doesn't kill you. So like sort of like the what doesn't kill you makes you stronger hypothesis, where the next time you see it, you'll be sort of primed and maybe they've upregulated some proteins or pathways or behaviors to, to not bleach the next time or to bleach, bleach less severely. So we've been looking at that, um, thinking about what are the consequences on coral populations. So thinking about survival and growth in the field. And then we also look at sort of like I mentioned with that symbiosis acidification is just what are the basic biological mechanisms of coral symbiosis and how they respond to stresses in the surrounding environment. Okay, so here we're gonna go to Heron Island um, on the Great Barrier Reef. And so we wanted to ask the question um, in this case is do corals exposed to extreme temperature fluctuations on a daily basis have elevated heat tolerance? Right, so if corals, there are places and reefs on the world just by virtue of the physics of the environment where you get much warmer temperatures than you would ex sort of like the, the mean surrounding sea surface temperatures. And then does this higher heat tolerance say, if this is true, does that elevated heat tolerance help them withstand marine heat waves? So does it matter really? Okay, so this is just a cartoon map. This is um, Australia here. This is the Great Barrier Reef that you see here. And Heron Island is at the very southern end of that reef. And so this little blob here, this is the actual land mass. So the island is tiny, but the reef is actually quite large. And so we have this sort of orangey habitat here is called the reef flat. So this is sort of a shallow, uh, very still, almost bathtub-like environment where they see huge swings in temperature across the day-night cycle. And then we have this sort of darker blue here, sort of surrounding that is the reef slope. And this is a little bit deeper, and this is where all the waves crash and you get lots and lots of mixing and water flow. And so these environments, with respect to temperature, are a lot more stable because you're just getting a lot of mixing with sort of the open ocean water. Um, and these reefs look a little bit different from one another, as you might imagine. So this is the reef slope, that sort of stable temperature environment. You see all kinds of corals and fishes. Um, and this is the reef flat. Um, you can see this sort of like 
flattened structure across the top, and that's because that's the low tide line. So corals can't grow in air, so this is sort of, sort of the maximum upper extent that they can grow. But we see a lot of the same species in both habitats. Um, so we've had temperature sensors out on these reefs just to look to see how the temperature um, dynamics play out over the years. And so these are data showing you temperature here across a single year. So you can see, you know, it's warmer in the austral summer, colder in the winter, as you would expect. Um, and this is the reef flat. We see the same sort of seasonal general pattern. But what you see is the spread of the data here this reef on the flat, these corals see temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius on a regular basis. This is not an unusual temperature for them to see, whereas these corals never see anything over 27 and a half, 28 degrees, right? So these corals are separated by, you know, a few hundred meters from each other, like really not very far, but they see, this is sort of like our future ocean conditions in some of the worst case global projection scenarios, but these corals are already seeing those temperatures you know, on a daily basis in the sort of the summer months. So we wanted to know like, how are these corals, do these corals bleach at a different temperature than corals in this habitat? Um, and one of the things that we're interested in in the field is that the hypothesis is this daily exposure to extreme temperatures makes these corals more resilient to climate change. And maybe corals living in these shallow, stressful habitats are actually um, sort of like a, a source of resilience that could repopulate future reefs if the temperatures get too warm for, say, corals adapted to this sort of more stable, cooler slope environment. So um, this is a hypothesis. It sort of remains to be determined. Um, so we set out to test this. And I'm going to show you some data that Marcelina helped us collect. So we took these corals from these two habitats. We took the same species of coral to try to keep everything constant and exposed them to a temperature stress, sort of like our control, you know, and then increasing stepwise temperatures and looked to see how they did. And so this graph here um, is just showing you how well they're doing. So high numbers mean they're doing well, low numbers mean they're doing poorly. And basically what we see is like a very steep drop off when you expose them to high temperatures, which means that they're starting to bleach and lose their symbionts. Um, but what we did find was that the corals from that stable reef slope, that more benign environment, bleach earlier at a one degree Celsius lower temperature than the corals from the flat. So supporting our hypothesis that, that those daily exposures to high temperatures are actually promoting heat tolerance in these corals, even though they're the same species and they're uh, the same population. But so my next question was, does this really matter out in the field? So in 2020, there was a heat wave that hit the Great Barrier Reef. You can see basically over here, these corals on the reef flat saw these really extreme temperatures. These corals saw temperatures above what they normally see, but you know, it didn't get nearly as hot as it got on the reef flat. And the magnitude was greater on the reef flat. So it wasn't just plus one degree here and plus one degree here over their normal conditions. It was like plus one here and plus three over here. So like it's not, a heat wave does not affect every habitat to the same magnitude. And so that was really interesting to see in our data. And so here's just some pictures to show you this was the reef slope, that stable environment before. During the bleaching event, we see sort of patchy bleaching where some of the individuals bleach, but you can also see these corals next to them don't bleach. So we had, um, after the heat wave, about a 20% decline in live coral cover. So there was mortality, but not an enormous amount. And um, when we go to the reef flat, here we see before, during, you can see it's just everything is bleached on the reef flat and then about a 70% decline in coral cover. So only 30% of the corals survived that heat wave in 2020. So that's a massive loss of the, the living corals on that reef. So, um, so what we're seeing out in the field is that this sort of disproportionately larger magnitude of temperature stress in these sort of shallower, more extreme environments is overwhelming sort of the natural adaptation of those corals to that extreme environment. So, if these corals all die during a heat wave, we're not gonna be able to use them to reseed these reefs like as the ocean temperature sort of gradually increases over the next 100 years. So basically my take home is we need to act now. The benefits of resilience um, to these extreme habitats is already being overwhelmed. 2020, that's already three years ago, almost four years ago now. Um, and something that we do look about, but I'm not going to talk about today, is the combined effects of ocean warming and acidification. And these two things seem to have a synergistic interaction with each other that compounds the stress of, that corals are experiencing. So really, 
drastic reductions in fossil fuel emissions are really the only key to the long-term survival of these ecosystems. Um, even though there are some mitigation steps we can take in the meantime, rising sea surface temperatures are really starting to overwhelm these ecosystems. Okay, so um, if we look at now, so that was a single heat wave. So I'm gonna take you to Hawaii now and talk about some work where we've been looking at the effects of multiple successive heat waves on the corals that live there. And so this is the island of Oahu. This is Pearl Harbor. Honolulu is right here. And so we work at a marine station here on the windward side of the island um, where we have some really beautiful reefs that have 80% live coral cover, some of the highest coral cover in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and this is the bay, a zoom in of the bay, and this is the reef where we do our work. And so in 2015, there was a big heat wave and we went out and actually tagged individual coral colonies. These are little cattle ear tags that we see on livestock. We zip tie them to these corals. And what I hope you can see pretty obviously here is this coral did not bleach and this coral is very bleached, right? So we see these two are the same species side by side on the reef. So they're experiencing the same temperature and light conditions, but we see very different responses to that heat stress event. So we've now been following these corals since 2015. So through eight summer seasons now um, and ongoing to see how are these corals surviving in response to these heat waves? Is it different um, between these bleaching individuals and ones that don't bleach um, and what's going on? So here's just a temperature plot over the last 10 years to show you there was a heat wave in 2014, another one in 2015, and another one in 2019. So we've actually tagged these corals here. It can actually go back when the 2019 heat wave happened. We could then test to see with our knowledge about their history of bleaching, how did they perform on that second um, exposure, which, which is technically a third exposure. And so to show three heat waves in the span of 10 years is appalling, right? Like it used to be a once in a lifetime, once in maybe a hundred years, and now heat waves that can, are severe enough to cause bleaching are expected to happen every two to three years now, sort of moving forward. Um, so this is a really strong stress that's gonna, has already wreaked a lot of havoc on reefs. So it's about 50% of live corals historically have already been lost. So we're dealing with, we've got half of them still surviving um, and we're trying to understand, you know, how these, this increasing frequency of heat waves is affecting them. Okay. so. Um, these are data, so we did this with two species because this is a second species where we also see the same thing where we have a coral that bleached right next to the same species that didn't um, over the last eight or nine years. And so we see corals that bleach, they start to recover, they bleach again the following summer and then they recover. Whereas the corals that don't bleach just stay not bleached. This is the second bleaching event. So this coral, they bleached. So up this high number here is they bleached a lot and then they recovered. The second event, this species didn't bleach the second time around, whereas this species did bleach the second time around. So we're actually seeing very different responses in these two species to a second heat wave. Um, and there, so now what we're seeing, this coral seems to have gained heat tolerance, this species, even though it used to bleach very severely. Whereas this coral, now it's bleaching every single fall, even without a heat wave. So these corals seem to have accumulated stress so that even the seasonal warm temperatures that aren't past their bleaching thresholds are actually causing bleaching. So like this is this coral here just a year ago. So it was no heat wave, but you can see it's white. Like it's lost the majority of its symbiont. So we're seeing sort of divergent, very different responses in these two species. But I will point out these corals that didn't bleach still don't bleach every year. We might get a little bit of paling here and here, but we have individuals of both species of these corals that seem to be resistant to bleaching. Um, the unfortunate thing, this shading in the background is showing us how much of each coral colony died. And so for this species, even the corals that don't bleach are showing mortality. So part of that colony is dying back through time. So we haven't lost very many whole colonies, but the colonies are getting smaller. Whereas this species here, after this bleaching event, the corals that bleached lost about 20% of their tissue, but then they grew back and regrew and they haven't shown any additional mortality since that 2015 event. So um, yeah, so the consequences of losing half of the live tissue here is dramatic because that's each polyp of a coral reproduces. So you can imagine not only are they not growing as much, but their ability to make offspring is actually quite diminished because of this um, response to these heat waves. Okay, so just to sort of summarize this, we sort of 
what we're seeing on the reefs is very different trajectories for different individuals, even within a single species, where if you have an initial coral that doesn't bleach in response, this pink color here is like a heat wave, we see some corals just stay resistant. So these are the corals that we tagged that didn't bleach and they continue to not bleach. So this is sort of our, hopefully our you know, heat stress resistant gene pool that we can think of for using for both understanding the biology of heat stress responses in corals, but then also these corals could be used for restoration or targeted for conservation because they are probably the most likely to survive into the future as heat waves become more common. Um, we do also see corals that resist a heat wave and then bleach during the second exposure. We have corals that bleached in the first exposure and then go on to not bleach in the second exposure and vice versa, corals that are doing worse and worse with each repeat exposure. So you don't need to worry about that text. Okay, so, so next I'm gonna talk to you about the, the mechanisms that we're looking at. So diving down in the biological scale to more of the cellular level and looking at you know how do corals respond to stresses in the surrounding environment and just like, if you don't know how a coral works at a fundamental level, it's hard to understand its response to stressors because we don't know what normal is. It's hard to know like what a stress response is. So one of the things we're just trying to understand is just how does a coral be a coral? Okay, so this is again work from Hawaii where we have that, those bleached and non-bleached corals. And one of the things that we look at in my lab is just what is the pH of the cell and how does that differ with heat stress and acidification stress from things like ocean acidification. So what I'm showing you in this graph here, this is the intracellular pH. So what is the pH and acid base status inside of these coral cells? And we see a healthy coral without a heat wave both our bleached and non-bleached individuals is the same, but if you add a heat wave, this is the 2019 heat wave, the corals that don't bleach don't show any signs of change or stress here, but the corals that bleach, we see the cells start to acidify. And so we don't know what is causing this, but things like metabolism, so your mitochondria inside of your cells that do respiration and give you energy to move your muscles and to eat and things like that, they also release carbon dioxide, which dissolves inside of your cell and creates acid. So this could be a reason why we're seeing this um, increase in temperature causing an increase in metabolism, which could disrupt the, the acid-base balance inside of the cells. And so this was work collect, data collected by Lulu Allen Waller, who's a PhD student in the lab. Okay, and so how does this acid-base status is really important for just um, cellular function, right? If the pH inside of your cells gets a little bit off in one direction or another, your enzymes stop working and that's not very good for survival, as you can imagine. So um, we're really interested in how corals regulate the pH inside of their cells, both because it's sensitive to temperature and it's sensitive to acidification. So we think this might be a way sort of a cellular mechanism that brings together the sort of two sides of the climate change coin in the ocean, which is warming and ocean acidification. So if this is our coral cell here in this black outline, we have the animal has mitochondria, which um, does aerobic respiration. So they consume oxygen and release CO2 as they convert sugars into energy. But we also have an algae, which does photosynthesis. So it takes up this carbon dioxide takes energy from the sun and converts that into sugars, which can then feed back into this uh, mitochondrial respiration. But then, like I said, this CO2, it dissolves and you get protons, which is acid and uh, bicarbonate. And so these ions um, need to be buffered inside of the cell. And so they need, the cell also needs to know that this acidification is happening. So we've been studying a sensor inside of the cell that detects changes in protons and pH in the cell. And so this sensor is called soluble adenyl cyclase, which is a mouthful. So we just call it SAC for short. Um, and this enzyme, it detects bicarbonate ions, sort of a proxy for uh, pH inside of the cell. And it makes a signaling molecule. It converts ATP into cyclic AMP, which is a universal messenger molecule inside of the cell. The cyclic AMP itself doesn't change the pH inside of the animal cells, but what it does, in animals at least, in humans I should say, is it initiates a signaling cascade that turns on protein phosphorylation, um, it can alter gene expression, it can do a whole wide range of different things. So in coral biology, we don't really understand how this pathway works, but we've have confirmed that this enzyme, which was discovered in mammals, 
is actually present in coral. So this is an evolutionarily very highly conserved enzyme. Actually, bacteria even have a version of this enzyme. And we see that it's functionally important in corals. OK, so this is a cross-section of a coral um, of the tissue that we're looking at under the microscope. And what I've done here is just to look to see where this pH sensor is located. So that the red that you see here is the, an antibody that recognizes that sensor. So we can see where it's located inside of the cells. Um, these little green circles here are the algae. And then the blue, those are the nuclei. So basically, we see the sensor everywhere, which makes sense because every single cell is going to have to regulate its pH status um, and keep it constant. Um, we also looked to see if this pH sensor was important for coral growth, so the growth of the skeleton, so sort of deposition of this um, calcium carbonate. And what I didn't tell you in my intro is that this tissue that's over the skeleton, there's little pockets of fluid that are in between the animal tissue and that basically that limestone skeleton. And that's where the skeleton is laid down. That's where you get the crystallization of those ions that start off in solution and you wind up with the skeleton. And so we can grow corals on microscope slides and actually look at this fluid that's in between the skeleton and the tissue on this sort of growing edge. So this is our little coral colony growing on a glass slide. And if you zoom in on this little box, you can see this growing edge of the colony sort of creeping over the glass. And so as long as there isn't too much skeleton that blocks the light, we can look up from underneath and look at the fluid and the, the newly deposited um, skeleton. So that's what this picture here, so this is that picture from the previous slide. We can stain the seawater with the fluorescent dye that we can use to measure pH. Um, so we can measure pH of the seawater, which would be this area here. These little pockets of orange here, this is the dye inside of that calcifying fluid. And so then now what we can do is we can use um, um, drugs to activate or inactivate proteins that we think might be important in calcification and in regulating the pH of this fluid. And so that's this graph here. I've added an inhibitor of our pH sensor. And the main takeaway here is just that if you inhibit the pH sensor, this fluid gets more acidic, which inhibits calcification. So in order for calcium carbonate to precipitate, it has to be basic. And so the corals actually make that calcifying fluid more basic than the surrounding seawater. But if you eliminate that pH sensor, they lose that ability. Um, so that's, that's the pH of that fluid. And we also looked at the growth of the crystals by staining them with calcium, which is this dye that fluoresces green and it gets incorporated into the skeleton. So then we can measure over time how much new skeleton are these corals laying down at the microscopic level. And so this graph is just showing if you inhibit that pH sensor, calcification drops in half. So clearly very important for coral growth here. OK, so the last little story that I'll talk to you about today is looking at the role of this pH sensor in coral reproduction. So as I mentioned, each polyp reproduces. This is our coral from Hawaii. It's a hermaphrodite, so each polyp makes both eggs and sperm. And they wrap them in these little um, floaty packages that they then spit out of their mouth. And those packages float to the surface of the water. Um, and break apart, and then the sperm can swim around and find eggs to fertilize. And so we've been interested in understanding the role of this pH sensor in sperm motility, because we actually sort of, we do a lot of cheating of looking at coral or human biology and trying to sort of apply that to coral. So this SAC enzyme is uh, super critical for the maturation and the function of human sperm and other mammalian sperm. So we wanted to see, we know corals have it, so is it important in reproduction? OK, so and this reproduction in this species happens a couple times a year for a few days after the new moon in June and July. So it's a very precise time. It's like 8.50 PM. Um, and you have to be there. And you have to be ready to get <laughs> your bundles, which are our sperm and eggs. So here's um, a falcon tube, if some of you lab rats might know about these. Um, and so you can actually just collect those floaty bundles they can break apart in these tubes, and you can do things like in vitro fertilization with corals uh, because of this. OK, so this is a protein expression blot where we've just looked to see, do the sperm have this protein? And they do. So we see multiple bands, and we can stain the sperm cells themselves. So here's a coral sperm. Looks very spermy. Um, you have the head here. This is the nucleus, and the mitochondria are in this section here. And then this is the flagellum, right? So we can stain the nucleus in blue. And then this green signal here, that's the protein, that pH-sensing protein. So we can look and see they do express this protein in the sperm. 
Um, and then we can do um, experiments where we turn on the motility of the coral sperm. And this is a pH dependent process. So if you increase the pH of the sperm, which is this dashed line here, motility goes from zero to 100. So coral sperm motility is extremely pH dependent and it needs to be basic for the coral sperm to start swimming. So with a concern is that with ocean acidification, it's gonna make it harder for sperm to start swimming, which is gonna make it harder for them to find an egg to fertilize, and you're gonna get decreased reproductive success in corals because of this. Okay, um, we also see when you activate coral sperm motility that we see a spike in cyclic AMP, that molecular signal that's produced by our enzyme SAC. And so um, this is the last thing I'll show you today, but we did an experiment with coral sperm where we inhibit that pH sensor and we try to activate the sperm. And so what you see here, this is our control. You see these super fast zoomy circles. Those are the sperm swimming like crazy. If we add our inhibitor, if we inhibit that pH sensor on the right, you see the sperm are still alive, but they're just twitching. They're not actually swimming. So it's gonna be really hard for these guys to find an egg if they can't swim forward, right? So um, just at this point, we've just confirmed a mechanism of how coral sperm start to swim. And the next step is to try to understand how environmental stressors affect sperm's ability to swim and what the role of the signaling pathway might be in that process. Okay, so that's just a quantification of that. So I'm gonna skip that. So I'm just gonna leave you on a positive note. Um, this is a coral from the Great Barrier Reef. There's me for scale. It's huge, it's hundreds of years old. We don't actually know how old this coral is. But this is a single individual that's been around for many hundreds of years that's still alive and doing well out on the reef. So there are a lot of um, really amazing ecosystems um, around the world that are still alive and thriving and left to save. So I think, you know, if we act now, you know, use our science to better understand how these systems work and to come up with restoration and management strategies that are effective, that can sort of be a stopgap as we move towards um, a net zero economy. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. And of course, I have to thank the members of my lab who do make all this work possible. If anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Hi, my name is Jagger Fleissig. I'm a student in environmental chemistry and a really great talk. I was just curious, you mentioned earlier that the algae is necessary for coral survival. Mm -hmm. Is the opposite true? Do we know that the algae could survive uh, outside of the coral? That's a great question. The answer is it depends. There are, so these algae, there's a huge diversity of them and the many, many, many species. Some of them can live free living, like in the sediments in the seawater. Many of them we've just never found, like whether they can live on their own or not is not entirely known. But um, in general, the coral is 100% dependent on the symbionts and the symbionts aren't always. Yeah, so it sets up an interesting conflict where if I can live on my own, then I don't, you know, they have sort of an escape route if the coral is dying due to temperature stress. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Bao Yi, so I'm also from uh, environmental chemistry. I have one question, like if the global warming continues and all the coral turn into bleach resistant species, mm -hmm. will they actually uh, because the biodiversity is lost, will actually uh, cause any negative impact on the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer is yes. So as you start to lose these, the more sensitive species from the system, the community becomes less resilient. The complexity of the reef structure itself goes down. So there's fewer and fewer species that the reef will actually support. And a lot of the species, like that, one of the slides that I showed you that had all those different animals, that's from one species specific interaction with a single species of coral. So like the more species of coral you lose, you start to lose all these other very species specific other creatures that associate with those corals. And then the structure, some of the corals that are most resistant tend to grow really slowly and are sort of mounding and don't have the same three-dimensional structure that the more branchy sensitive species tend to have. So, so yeah. And then as you lower diversity, 
you know, a single disease that affects a single species could wipe out the temperature tolerant corals and then you've got nothing left. So, you know, the system gets more sensitive to other stressors other than temperature as it gets less diverse. I was wondering, um, what is the benefit to the corals to have such a large skeleton compared to their living tissue? Yeah, um, competition, I think, is my best answer, right? So on a coral reef, space is premium, and everybody that lives on the bottom needs space. So in order to compete, they can actually, and to create more space, like you can have a coral that's like on this much of the bottom holding on, but it can grow this massive three-dimensional structure to both capture sunlight and to just take up more space and to have more tissue and to grow. So, and corals fight tooth and nail, right? They're like trying to constantly trying to grow over each other. So if you're in a healthy reef, it's like a coral battle for space. And the faster you can grow, you can shade other corals. They send out special tentacles. They invert their guts to digest their neighbors. So there's this, all this warfare that goes on. And so building a skeleton helps them. Um, and the skeleton also have helps them capture and reflect sunlight back to the symbionts. So it actually also is a physical way to boost photosynthesis. Yeah. I wanted to ask if pH and temperature change are independent stressors to coral or if they're correlated. Um, yeah, they're both. <laughs> so there's, there's events on reefs where it's a pH stress. So like upwelling, so deep water comes up and is often more acidic, so that would be mostly just a pH stress. Um, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes the greenhouse gas effect. And as that carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it creates acid. So those two things are tightly correlated. Um, but we don't see acid waves in the same way we see heat waves. But we do. there are sort of natural upwelling events and things that can bring more acidic seawater onto a reef. And so one question is, do reefs that see a lot of upwelling have a lot of acidification resistance mechanisms because of that. Hi, my name's Manoa. I'm in environmental chemistry. And I was wondering, I know there's been some research into like corals that are deeper within the ocean so that they kind of uh, don't have to deal with like such a big pH change and like all the heating um, that's like more common at the surface. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, is that like a promising thing to look at? Um, like at the deeper corals and how they deal with like less sunlight, but they're still able to grow? Yeah, yeah, so one of, that's really great um, that you asked that because it's one of the things that people in the coral world have been thinking a lot about lately is are these deeper reefs a refuge from the heat stress that's happening at the surface? Um, and the jury's kind of still out on that one. We don't really know. Um, there are signs that those corals are adapted to really stable temperature conditions and may, even though it's not as hot in deeper waters, the temperature is still increasing and that these corals, because they're so adapted to a stable environment, might actually perform really poorly as they get this sort of slower rise in temperature. Um, but, but we don't really know. And there are species that can live in the shallows and in deep waters, like these mesophotic low light, you know, they're at like one or 200, 300 meters deep. Um, so yeah, so stay tuned. Yeah. One over here. Hi, Katie. Uh, Phil Ray from Department of Biology. Uh, and it, it's affiliate to the question that's already been um, posed. And that is, is there such thing as a coral biobank? Is, is such provision there is, yeah. uh, in play? And um, where, whereabouts are the, such biobanks uh, located? And what sort of uh, species diversity is at play there? Yeah, so there are coral biobanks. That's something that's been growing recently. So there are researchers that have been working and developing techniques to cryopreserve sperm, to cryopreserve eggs, embryos, and adult tissues, because corals, in theory, can kind of live forever, because they have, they just grow and they reproduce asexually by breaking off and growing. So even if you had adult tissue, it has stem cells and the ability to reproduce. Um, I know the Smithsonian Natural History Museum is involved in a lot of this work. I think that's where a lot of the biobanks are actually located. Um, as far as the diversity of species that we've banked so far, it's you could probably count them on your hands. Um, there's hundreds of coral species in the world, and so every species has a different abundance of lipids, different composition of lipids. And so if you're trying to do cryopreservation, um, they have to come up with a new protocol for every single species.
and every single life stage and cell type. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. But yeah. Hi. I had a quick question. Um, with coral bleaching, have you seen a decrease in biodiversity uh, in general with species on reefs? Yeah, so with bleaching, um, we tend to see a decrease in biodiversity of the surrounding species, so not just the corals. And then as corals die after bleaching events, the reef, they basically break down into rubble and just crumble. And then you lose all of the species that lived in the sort of healthy coral structure. So um, there's a huge decline in biodiversity associated with bleaching events. Also because these other species, fish, lobsters, worms, what, what have you, are also not used to seeing these high temperatures. So they are also undergoing stress during these heat waves. Um, if you think about, there was like the blob in the Pacific Northwest a couple years ago. There's no corals there, but the heat stress causes massive mortality in things like fishes, oysters, all sorts of other species that are also sensitive to temperature stress. Hello, um, great talk. My name is Fees. So I wanted to ask, do you have any insight into what like molecular mechanism might be causing like different reactions to eat depending on like what species? So you mentioned that there were like some species after um, experiencing an eat wave, they bleach, while others become resilient. Is there mm -hmm. maybe something on a cellular level that might be occurring and causing that? Yeah. Probably. I'm sure that there is, and we don't know exactly what's happening. So there's, you know, there's heat shock proteins that are involved. Um, you know, there's reactive oxygen scavengers that might be helping, you know, mitigate the damage that's happening during heat stress. But there's still a ton we don't know, like of a single species, why some are resistant and others are not. Maybe they have a different disease history. Maybe they're different ages. Maybe they, one had a big breakfast and the other one didn't. Like, we really don't know what's driving them. We do know that the species of symbiont they have can influence at the temperature that they bleach at. Um, but as far as the molecular mechanisms of why that is, there's a huge amount to left to be learned there. Yeah. Hi, do events like uh, El Nino and La Nina affect these like events? Like yes. does it bleach more? Yeah, so El Nino especially, we tend to see a lot more bleaching in the Pacific during El Nino years because you get the equator gets warmer, the seawater around the equator. And so that's where most corals tend to live. And so, um, yeah, the biggest bleaching event that we've ever had in the world was associated with the previous El Nino, and so we're in an El Nino year now. So we're expecting to have quite a lot of bleaching over the next 12 months. Um, I don't know if you all saw all in the news, it was 100 degrees, the seawater in Florida, Fahrenheit. Um, right, so those corals just cooked and they had huge mortality, and we think that might have something to do with the El Nino event, yeah. Hello, um, so... Well, we would obviously prefer to keep, like, natural coral, like, alive. Um, what about, like, artificial coral reefs? Like, what's that looking like in terms of yeah. development? Yeah. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense has um, put in a pretty good chunk of money to try to think about that and how to build artificial reefs. Because one service reefs provide, which I don't think I mentioned, is just shoreline protection. So the, that three-dimensional structure that the reef creates is a wave break. So waves during storms break out on the reef as opposed to onshore, causing erosion and flooding um, of buildings and whatever. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are efforts and research underway to build artificial reefs. Um, you know, people sink ships and things to create artificial reefs or sink tires, which is a terrible idea because they're toxic. Um, and depending on where you are in the world, the substrate you use matters. So if you sink a ship in the Central Pacific where there's really low iron in the water, you get massive algal blooms that are toxic to the reef. If you sink a ship which has iron because it has all this metal, in a volcanic island, which has a lot of iron, like Hawaii, let's say, you're not gonna see the same problem and maybe that's a good artificial reef. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work being done coming up with like 3D printing of like three dimensional structures that would mimic a coral shape and can you seed corals onto those structures to help them solidify. Um, the problem with an artificial reef, of course, is that it erodes, right? You don't, if, if you don't have a coral constantly rebuilding that three dimensional structure, it just breaks down with like the waves and, things growing and boring into it. Um, 
yeah, so it's a, it's a tough problem to solve. Um, hi, I'm Trinity. I'm another student in environmental chemistry. Um, and I wanted to ask if we have any strategies currently that can help mitigate the impacts of heat waves on corals. Um, not really is my short answer. Yeah, so there's a lot of things people are looking into, like releasing aerosols over the reef during a heat wave or like literally shading areas of the reef because so the bleaching response is worse under high light conditions, which tend to happen when it gets warmer and things get still and you're not getting a lot of circulation. Um, yeah, in, so in Florida, when the water was super, super hot this summer, people actually like took corals out of the water and put them in aquaria on land, which you, is tough to scale. But if you're trying to save an endangered species or you're trying to save um, certain genotypes, then that is something people are actually doing today. Um, but it's tough, right? Like reefs are huge and every reef has different needs and different species and different communities around it. So. Yeah, there, there's not a good solution that's scalable yet. Yeah. Hi. Um, in the part of the talk, I think it was when you were talking about the Great Barrier Reef, when um, you discussed the experiment where you subjected them to heat and to see how they responded. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, like, what did the experimental design look like? Um, like, how, how did you, how did the lab do that? A picture. Um, we get tanks. So we go out diving on the reef and collect coral fragments that are probably about this big. Um, and the cool thing that's nice with corals experimentally is like each coral is a colonial. So it's a clone. So if you break off different branches, they're genetically identical to one another. So then you can put one in one treatment and one in the other and they're genetically matched. Um, as opposed to using different individuals like you would have to do with like fish or something. Um, and so, yeah, so we collect little pieces of corals, bring them back to the marine station in coolers with seawater, and then we put them in tanks. So the tanks are maybe like this big, and you can just set them in the tanks or hang them from fishing line in the tanks, and then put heaters in, you turn on the heat, um, and you watch to see what they do. Yeah, and you just do that a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Nadia. I'm also part of the environmental chemistry class. And you mentioned how you've seen how there is certain resilience to coral reefs, um, even though, depending on the species, even though sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm just curious. I know you mentioned that even though there has been resilience, you still call for a need to like act now to reduce fossil fuels. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. to see like how you've seen or hope that your research has helped influence like call to actions or policy changes to protect them. Yeah, I mean, I think what I've, what I would like, I think my research, what we've seen just from observing what's happening on reefs is that sort of this onslaught of repeat heat stress, we're just starting to lose individuals, even the ones that look resistant. So you can't just look at a coral and say it didn't bleach because two years later we see that half of that coral died even though it didn't bleach. So, um, and then, you know, the other thing in Australia, like we see corals from these resilient, resistant, you know, extreme stress tolerant habitats, but then those corals are also dying during heat waves. So it's not actually a refuge. Um, so I think, you know, those things together, we, we, the, the evidence is accumulating that the problem is happening now and these sort of almost excuses, or we're not looking for excuses, but we're looking for areas of hope of like, what can we do? Are there areas of reefs that are more resistant? Can we target those for conservation and protection? Or can we use those to seed other reefs? Maybe, but in the meantime, these reefs are dying. I think that's the last question. So, um, so I, unfortunately it's time to, today to conclude today's program. So let's thank Dr. Barrett again. Thank you. Uh, and, um, to see a replay of today's lecture or any other talk from our library of lectures, visit us at Penn Arts and Sciences website or the Penn Arts and Sciences um, Library. And so sadly, this is also our last knowledge by the slice of the semester, but we hope to see you in the spring and um, well, as we kick off the series again. So thank you everyone for coming.